Hello, this is going to be the review for Chapter 20, which is DNA technology. Um, what we're going to start with today is talking about restriction enzymes. Uh, restriction enzymes cut DNA in certain places uh, along uh, the DNA strand. And uh, what you can see here is that the restriction enzyme is really going to uh, cut only what are known as palindromes. Palindromes, uh, as you know from class, are sequences of code that are the same going forward as they are going backwards. And really, one of the main reasons for doing that uh, is because you want to create a jagged edge along which you cut the DNA. Um, so in this example, what we're getting here uh, when we cut the DNA is um, a jagged edge that when separated, this end will go this way, the other end will go that way, and you'll end up getting two sticky ends for which uh, a new gene or um, something that wants to be uh, inserted or can be inserted into the DNA can get inserted, but um, in order to do that first, you have to have those sticky ends where you can actually uh, lay a gene onto. Um, this is done for a few reasons. You want, uh, as the DNA coming into the, 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 or as the gene coming into the DNA, if it flips around or twists around at all, you want it to be the same going forwards as it, as it is going backwards, so uh, it's easier to actually attach, and then those sticky ends allow it to uh, have something to grab onto so that DNA uh, ligase can then come in there and uh, stick those two things, two things together. So uh, what we did in lab was we took E. coli bacteria, okay, this, is, this will be our E. coli, and uh, E. coli bacteria has certain uh, bacterial chromosomes already in it. But what we did in lab was we took advantage of a plasmid. And a plasmid is a short circular piece of DNA that can be um, transformed or inserted into any uh, bacterial cell we want to insert it into. So the, the gene we were dealing with was called PGLO. And the PGLO gene had a few genes on it. Okay? The few that were important was, uh, one, it had an ampicillin resistant gene. It had also a gene for glowing, okay? And um, finally, the, uh, the operon that would turn this gene on, okay, and I'll just kind of draw this right here, was the operon for arabinose. I don't know why this pen is not working here. Anyways, um, the... The arabinose operon, as it comes in contact with any of the uh, sugar present in the, uh, the gel that you were dealing with, is going to turn on the glowing gene inside the plasmid, thus expressing the glowing property. Um, and we were able to assume that the bacteria took up the plasmid on certain other gels that had ampicillin in it because of the resistance to ampicillin that the plasmid also brought to the bacteria. So. Uh, really, what, what we want you to know from uh, transformation is just throughout, throughout that experiment, what we did was we had the bacterial cells on ice. As we heated them up and created little micro pores in the bacteria, the, the plasmid moved into the bacterial cell and thus was taken up and then expressed by the bacteria. So uh, as you um, study that for the test, just keep in mind what transformation really is. Um, Next, we're going to talk about operons. Again, on the uh, operon for turning on the PGLO gene was the arabinose operon. So before it was modified, we had our strand of DNA, and we had our arabinose operon, and then a series of genes that made the protein to digest arabinose. Um, so those genes were present along the DNA strand, and they were never really you know, made unless the arabinose, I'll just draw a quick little carbohydrate there, arabinose molecule will attach to the operon, thus making these proteins, uh, or copying these genes, making those proteins to digest arabinose, and then, you know, turn off the making of those genes. So what scientists did instead, which uh, you can do in uh, various other circumstances, is take the same gene, use the same operon for arabinose, but instead of having these genes right here, okay, you're going to have one gene which can be for whatever you want it to be. 
and that gene was, in our case, PICLO, which caused the, uh, the bacteria to make a protein in the presence of, again, our, that's a really bad sugar, <laughs> in the presence of arabinose. Once arabinose was inside the gel, that activated the operon, changed its shape, and then allowed for this gene to be copied, thus getting the uh, bacteria to glow. So uh, operons are really the regulatory part of the gene that determines whether a gene is going to get copied or not. And uh, then after that protein has done its job, uh, it will thus take off, the op uh, take off the activator on that operon and then turn off what's being made. So that's actually how genes are controlled uh, within a cell. Uh, next, we're going to talk about gel electrophoresis. Uh, gel electrophoresis was um, just a way to compare two different individuals or two different organisms to each other uh, based on what their DNA fragments, uh, what their DNA fragment sizes were. So, um, in any gel electrophoresis, you're gonna what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a sample of DNA. Here's our sample, and you're gonna cut it with the same restriction enzyme for each individual you're comparing. So these three individuals down here were all cut with the same restriction enzymes. Uh, once those restriction enzymes are, are made, they can go through a process called PCR, where you amplify uh, all of these DNA markers. So this goes through PCR. And once that's done, you have a whole bulk of DNA that you can now compare. So after injecting that DNA into the gel right here, uh, what you're going to do is place it on the negative side, because remember, DNA is already negative, okay? Uh, and if it's already negative, when you turn on the uh, PCR machine, or I'm sorry, not PCR, uh, gel electrophoresis machine, uh, the DNA is going to flow towards the positive end of the gel because it's negative uh, inherently. So that as that DNA moves through, the longer segments will have a tougher time moving through the gel. Remember, the agar gel is almost exactly like jello. It has tiny little holes in it. Um, it's not really good to eat, but uh, I guess you could if you wanted to. The uh, agarose gel is going to separate these DNA fragments out um, according to size. So the longer fragments are going to have a tougher time moving through that gel uh, with all of the tiny little holes in it than smaller fragments will. And as the gel uh, is allowed to run, you will have a, a supposedly different fragment sizes that you can then compare between individuals uh, under UV light. Uh, next, we're going to talk about uh, one way to actually analyze um, your gel uh, and, and find genes inside of it that are uh, maybe kind of hidden from what you're looking for. So this is a, a diagram of a southern blot. Uh, it's actually in German, so a glass block is a sponge, I'm guessing, and a Slazelsung is the denaturing solution. Uh, I never took German, but I, I'm supposing that's what those words mean. Um, and the southern blot really takes advantage of the fact that we, as we denature DNA, we can identify certain um, genes inside of the DNA without actually um, having to find that sequence before we do the, the, uh, the gel run. So, so what you're going to do is you're going to take uh, a gene that has many different fragment sizes in it, and you're going to place that uh, over a denaturing solution. What the denaturing solution is then going to do is move through the sponge, and as it goes through the gel, it's going to turn the double-stranded DNA into single-stranded. Okay, um, And the single-stranded DNA, then, is going to be exposed in the middle uh, with all those nucleotides. And what you can do then is uh, transmit those single-stranded DNA uh, molecules onto a nitrocellulose odor, which I guess is the nylon membrane. Um, and that nylon membrane is then going to contain those single-stranded DNA um, uh, molecules, and when you pour a probe, which remember is a radioactive, we'll just say, sequence of letters, you can pour a code 
or I'm sorry, a probe over that nylon membrane, and whenever it finds the sequence you're looking for, which could be part of a gene or before a gene, it's going to light up and identify where that is. So you could have in a gel the same size fragment in two individuals, but only this one of the samples could light up. And if that, that one lights up, then you know that's the individual that has the gene you're looking for. But, you know, you could have mistaken that they had the same gene if you hadn't done that. So that's the purpose for southern blotting. Um, one uh, other thing we're going to talk about with uh, plasmids is that in order to express a plasmid inside a bacterial cell, there's a few problems in doing that. Um, pl bacterial cells do not have the enzymes to actually... Uh, go through RNA processing, which, if you, as you remember, splices out introns from an mRNA strand and makes a complete um, mRNA strand that goes to the ribosome. So instead, uh, what we can cleverly do is use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And what reverse transcriptase does is turns mRNA back into DNA. Sorry, I can't write today. Okay, so we got our mRNA strand. Um, it, uh, what reverse transcriptase does is actually turns that into a strand of complementary DNA alongside the mRNA strand. And then what reverse transcriptase can then do after the complementary strand is made is go back and copy that whole entire strand again and make a, a sequence of DNA out of what an RNA strand was previously. The advantages to that is that an mRNA strand that's already been processed does not have introns. Okay, and if it doesn't have introns, then the mRNA strand doesn't have to be processed if it's turned back into DNA. So that DNA can then be inserted into this plasmid, and once inserted into the plasmid, it can be copied and made into a protein as many times as you want without having to go through the whole, uh, the whole thing with uh, RNA processing. So that's, that's the advantage to that method here. Um, so, so through the, uh, actually, the, the late 20th century, the Human Genome Project was started, uh, and what scientists really wanted to do is map out every single nucleotide uh, in the human genome. So there's a few ways to do that, um, but it was really the most efficient way that was discovered was the, known as the Sanger method of sequencing, and the Sanger method of sequencing takes advantage of the fact that um, as we map out the different segments of code uh, on, a, on an actual chromosome, we can run those through a gel and eventually get the entire sequence of DNA that we're looking for. So let me explain to you how this works. Um, what is done is a strand uh, or a chromosome is taken and uh, it's going to be analyzed. Uh, we, we then create four different vials here. Uh, and each vial contains all of the nucleotides inside of them. So this vial of T contains A, C, T, and G. Okay, but it also contains a special T uh, called a didio nucleotide. And the didio nucleotide is going to stop the the making of a new strand every time it comes in contact with an A, because that A, that T is going to bond with an A, and then it's going to stop the actual making of a strand. So uh, that just happens by random chance every time a, a special T comes in contact with an A. And as that happens over and over again, you end up with a certain size segment um, that is always going to end with, let's say, a T. As you map those Ts out uh, on this certain gel, Okay, you'll get different fragment sizes, and you can do that with every single letter. After doing that with every single letter, amplifying them, running them through a gel, you can eventually map out what the entire sequence of DNA really is for that gene. So that's actually a very quick way of mapping out an entire genome, and it's already done. So we actually have the whole entire genome just by using this method and some really sophisticated computers. 
All right, last thing we're going to talk about are RIFLIPS, RFLPs. And what RIFLIPS are are just sequences that are going to be cut um, by a gene, uh, and that can be indicative of what actually comes before uh, a gene and, and telling you what the, the gene is. So an RFLP is just a sequence of DNA that can be cut by a restriction enzyme. And if, uh, as uh, people inherit different, you know, genes, so they could have the wild type or the mutant gene for some trait, um, RIFLIPS or RFLPs could actually change in accordance with attaining that new or mutant gene. So in this individual, we have the wild type uh, allele, which contains two sites for cutting. Um, and in this individual down here, allele 2, um, this, this person has uh, the same gene, or not the same gene, the same code, but uh, has a mutant allele, which has changed what the RFLP is going to be, thus changing the cutting sites. And uh, as those cutting sites are then run on a gel, you can notice the differences in cutting size and compare those individuals to each other. So um, restriction length polymorphisms are just used to kind of identify what genes can, can come after the segment of code, and they can be used to help cut the DNA and assess those differences. So that's going to be the end of the review for Chapter 20. Um, Good luck on the test, and we'll see you next time.